Thank you, Carol. And I am gonna just overview some of the things that we've done within UF Health. And you've heard a little bit about our program there from a kind of clinical implementation perspective. And I wanna focus on the educational pieces that we out, kind of rolled out in conjunction with that and what we've learned over the past few years. And so many of you have seen this slide. This is the start of our personalized medicine program. And um, Laurie talked earlier about the CYP2C19 clopidogrel implementation and outcomes with that. Um, as part of our, we are one of the IGNITE sites, and as part of our uh, IGNITE-funded activities, uh, one of our aims includes really education of both students, clinicians, and patients. And so I lead the educational aims within the UF Health program. And so kind of every time we think of something from a, an implementation perspective, uh, my first thought is to think of it from an educational perspective and what's needed to kind of take those clinicians to the next level based on that. And so this is just uh, data from provider surveys uh, that we were, and actually this is one of the surveys that is in the toolbox that we were talking about earlier, and I'll show you the toolbox later on, just to give you an idea of some of those resources that I think meet, for example, the implementation gap um, within pharmacogenomics. Um, these data are very consistent with what we see across a lot of different healthcare professionals and a lot of different surveys. The way you ask the question, um, most providers think that pharmacogenetic data will improve their ability to care for patients. It's an important part of patient care, but they don't really know what to do with it and they don't know how to use it. They don't feel prepared to do that. Um, usually this disparity is actually even greater, um, usually from a 90% to a, as low as 10% um, down at the bottom. And so I just wanted to show that we've kind of seen that uh, consistently within uh, the Ignite network also within pharmacogenomics. And I think this relates to, there was a great metaphor in something that I read recently that really related this to kind of why is it that we have this and talked really about the perfect storm. And so it's important within genomics that we look at kind of what we're doing, but I think so much of education is a part of implementation. Um, and I know I'm biased towards education, but when we think about overcoming a lot of these implementation barriers, I think we have to look at education. And so within this area, we know that providers really aren't well equipped. It's not covered as much as it is in medical school or in pharmacy school um, as we would like it to be. There's not a lot of experience with the tools and how to do this in practice and kind of these practice-based activities of understanding differences and how to use those. And so within our program, we really kind of said, how do we overcome that hurdle? How do we get over that storm? And the way that I've begun to think of it is really moving from knowledge to application and thinking, how do we help our clinicians move from maybe a knowledge-based foundation that they got in pharmacy school or medical school to be able to apply those principles within a complex patient care um, arena? So within the personalized medicine program, as I mentioned, we've looked at different areas and specifically implemented pharmacogenetic testing. And Laurie focused earlier on CYP2C19 and clopidogrel in that area. And this just lists kind of the different environments. And I think if you add this up, it's about 3,000, 2,000 tests in about uh, over 10 different specialties. And so I think that speaks a lot to the diversity of our implementation, but it also speaks to me to the diversity of the educational needs. And so each one of these kind of areas or implementations have had different needs from an educational perspective, and that education has been essential in helping to kind of get those implementations up and running and make sure that uh, providers are able to order and are willing to order tests um, that are offered either in a clinical or research environment. So Laurie also showed you this timeline earlier, and so um, there's kind of a parallel educational timeline that I wanted to talk to you about. And so you can see here our start in 2012 with CYP2C19 uh, testing in uh, clopidogrel patients in a, a specialized population um, to almost today where we're looking at CYP2C19 and PPIs um, through the years. And so just in the same way that our implementations have grown, our educational efforts have really grown through the years also. And we really learned a tremendous amount in the past five years in this area. Um, everybody who knows me knows I like to make things um, easy to remember. And so I was trying to think of what, if I could boil it down, what have we learned um, during this time? And to me, it kind of boils down to three things, um, interactivity, implementation, and individualizing. And so what I mean by that is we really learned that just like other adult education principles and just like other areas, we know that interactivity um, is important in education in pharmacogenomics and genomic medicine. The way that differs a little bit from kind of standard adult education is that we have some opportunities to, in, to interact with our audience or our trainees in a way that we don't through the use of their own genetic information. That's something that we've looked at within our program. It really has to be individualized. Um, what we do is very different with cardiology versus gastroenterology versus psychiatry. And it's really because we look to see what the needs of the audience are and what it is that they're wanting to get out of that kind of 
process, and then we begin to tailor that. And then I really think it has to be implementation focused. And yesterday, uh, um, Lynn mentioned the question about drug gene drug interactions, and to me that's really kind of an implementation focused issue. We really try to incorporate into our educational uh, aspects the complexity of patients who really do come back and come to you as a clinician with not just a very straightforward pharmacogenetic question, but they're on multiple drugs. They're on CYP2D6 inhibitors. They're, you know, they have contraindication to Ticagrelor or Prasugrel. And they, you know, what do you do in these kind of more gray areas? I think we really focus on trying to help and equip our students and practitioners to know what to do. From a timeline perspective, you can see we really started out with a more traditional grand rounds. We've had clinical decision support as part of our program since the start. Um, in 2013, we began to build in kind of post-implementation evidence analysis in patient cases. What we're doing right now with our site group, I really, really like, um, and this was a, the um, kind of the suggestion of um, the, the PI and that, uh, Carol Matthews and that uh, implementation of PEDS psych, but she asked us, can you please take patients that have been, have been genotyped and bring them back to the fellows and talk through them and basically kind of say, why is it that you recommended what you recommended? And so we specifically, and it's worked so well, I think we'll probably do that with every implementation from now on because I think it really is a part of the sustainability of that implementation is kind of circling back for those uh, practitioners. We've incorporated both student and uh, practitioner genotyping and then also case-based teaching. I think interactivity in this area has two components. One is potentially in using your own genetic information. The other is really interactive adult education principles like active learning in a flipped classroom environment. We also have a pharmacogenetics residency and a clinical uh, pharmacogenetic postdoctoral fellowship. We have students that uh, rotate with us both from our university and others, so we've had a chance to work with those students. And then in 2016, we held the inaugural Precision Medicine Conference. Um, this is a, a two and a half day conference that focuses on really, it's really focusing on implementation more and more, and I'll show you some of the differences. We offered that for the first time in 2016. We expanded that this last year in 2017 and are going to continue to do so for 2018. So I can talk to you about some of those plans and then how we're also looking at our graduate certificate in precision medicine and that development in conjunction with the College of Medicine. So as far as kind of who we've educated thus far, um, I estimated it's about 950, about 1,000 uh, participants have gone through an educational program in the last few years within our health system. And I look today, over half of these have been genotyped. And so our precision medicine conference attendees, student electives, our CEs, and um, some of the other group, so I would say definitely over half, but a good percentage of these um, educational participants have also had genotyping incorporated into their, uh, into their experience. So one of the things that I think was really laying the foundation for genotyping in the literature was really looking at whether or not this improved learning or changed students' knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. And that was kind of the first year that we did this uh, course. We looked at some of those questions. And I think this has been well established. Um, this is just a um, kind of a summary of the different uh, studies that are, have been published recently um, to date on using kind of personal genotype evaluation uh, within a classroom setting. And the thing that jumps out at me about this is is, is kind of twofold. Number one, all of these showed improvement in knowledge. They also showed kind of an improvement, no matter how they measured it, in attitudes and beliefs. The other thing I thought was interesting is they all use different methods, and they all use different specific ways to genotype. And so um, it's, there's not, I think, one right or wrong way to do this. And so I think this is just kind of a, an interesting comparison of, of looking at these side by side. So we, we looked at that within our first year, uh, within our program, but we really wanted to expand on that in the previous year. And I think that we, we tried to be able to, to develop a study design that did that. And so within the College of Pharmacy um, at the University of Florida, we have um, a required personalized medicine course. And so that's your left side there. And this was our control group. Um, in this course, students learn fundamentals. They learn about CPIC guidelines. Um, but it is more of a knowledge-based course, and so we really aren't talking as much about implementation principles as we're talking about fundamentals of pharmacogenomics knowledge and gene-drug pairs. The intervention group um, had the option to kind of have that learning enhanced by taking an additional elective, um, and that elective we focus completely on the clinical applications. And this is where I think teaching is really fun and I get really excited because we really got to do some of those things like Lynn said earlier, all of our class time and all of our interactivity was just sitting down and talking through patient cases and was just saying, well, what would you do in this situation? Well, what if they were on a CYP2D6 inhibitor? You know, how would that change? What if there was a contraindication to this? And so really talking through some of these. 
We also had the students develop uh, cases for implementation. And so we would say, which drug, drug, sorry, gene drug pair would you implement the first and why? I want you to develop a business plan or model, a 15 second elevator pitch as to why you would do this and really help them to consider all these different aspects that we've been talking about, both from a reimbursement, a complexity, a buy-in, um, evidence gap, implementation gap, and having them make a case for what they would do and really think about things in a practical environment. We also have students answer questions that come up commonly in practice. And so we've talked a little bit about different levels of evidence on, say, a panel-based test. And so we, we really try to say, well, what are you going to do with this information and show them how to quickly, at least in a clinical arena, identify what's the level of evidence that's associated with a specific gene drug pair. And that's part of their active assignments and walking them through that. So it's a lot of fun for me. We get to do a lot of really neat things. Those are, a lot of those are listed on here. The other piece that's different is that students do have the option of undergoing personal genotyping. And, um, and that's something that is optional. I think we've never had anybody not opt in to do it. So we have kind of a, something that's very popular um, with the students. One of the things that I struggled with was how do we incorporate that uh, from a teaching perspective in an anonymous manner? And I finally kind of hit on that. And we did this at our precision medicine conferences last year to use polling functionality, either in a webinar-based environment or in person, to allow people to anonymously kind of say, this is my genotype. So in this particular patient, this is what I would do, but they can do that in an anonymous fashion. So we can see a kind of a population of genotypes um, in the room, and that seems to help be able to use that information, but still allow everyone to kind of stay anonymous. So this course was associated with um, both a pre and a post course test, and the knowledge increased for both groups. And so in our control group, there was a baseline and a knowledge level that wasn't different than the intervention group. Um, and they increased in both courses. They're both excellent courses. They teach a little bit kind of they come at a problem from two different directions and in this case we really focus on the implementation direction within that elective um, and so they both had a significant increase in knowledge too what i think is really interesting and, and this was something that um, that we kind of teased out is that we as part of the test so they had a knowledge test that was aligned or mapped to the objectives of the course within each question on that knowledge test we asked them how confident are you that you're correct and so we basically said, how much you know, do you think you know what you're talking about? And so you can see on both the pre-course for both the control and the intervention, there was no correlation between knowledge and confidence. In other words, they really had no idea. They, you know, they would say uh, A, and I 100% think it's A, and they were 100% wrong, it was B, or something like that. And so it was, a, it was a nice way to see, do they really know what they think they know? We also asked them how well prepared they were to fulfill the pharmacist role in pharmacogenomics. And so the American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists has laid out a position statement that uh, lists and delineates roles of the pharmacist. So we were also able to, to kind of ask them how confident they felt about that. And they felt equally confident. So what we found is in the post, uh, post course uh, group in that intervention area, we saw that their, their scores were higher, but they also had a higher correlation. So they had a significant correlation between their confidence and their knowledge. In other words, if you look at this on kind of a spectrum of novice to competency, so there's a learning model, many that look at novice to competency, um, the first step of that is unconscious incompetence. You really don't know what you don't know versus, <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. That's kind of where you start out in medical school or you start any new topic. Um, the other end of that spectrum is unconscious competence, which we'll say is Julie, which is like, you know it so well, that you don't even think about it. And so, um, or many people in this room. And so, but it's an important thing to, to kind of think of because this is part of the learning process for all students. We've seen a similar shift in content and approach to teaching within our precision medicine conference for healthcare professionals. And so you can see in 2016, we had 150 attendees um, from 30 states. And then this past year, we had 32 states and five countries represented. And we've seen this kind of same shift. And so this is just a breakdown of the type of things we were teaching. And you can see over on the, the left-hand side, for example, we started out in 2016 with about 16% of the content looking at how to implement. By 2017, that increased to almost half of the course content, half of the Precision Medicine Conference was focused on how do you do this, addressing that implementation gap that we looked at or kind of came up in the last hour. And we see that kind of progressively we're learning more and more as we go along the importance of incorporating that into our teaching. And then also we've increased significantly the interactivity. And so you can see the first year we had about 38, 40% of our content was interactive. The second year is up to 65%. So our conference this year was very different and I think it will continue to, uh, to grow and change. 
our next steps, and then I'm gonna just show you real quick some of the resources or how to access the Ignite Spark toolbox, which has come up a couple of times because a lot of what we've learned, I think, points to the ability of, a, of that type of a resource to meet this implementation gap. Our next steps, we're working right now with the um, Office of CME and the College of Medicine to expand that Precision Medicine Conference to continue to focus on kind of what's new and these developing trends and implementation um, to look at uh, that for, for March 2018 is when that will be uh, scheduled. And then we're also working very closely with the College of Medicine to develop a graduate certificate um, in Precision Medicine. And so I'm really excited about this. We've gotten a lot of great feedback um, and uh, uh, different faculty involved within the College of Medicine, and I think we'll have this up and running and have, have this uh, submitted back for revision to the Faculty Graduate Council within the next few months, and so I'm excited to see that become a part of what we can offer from a, both a curricular and an academic perspective. Last thing I wanted to show you was just to kind of give you an idea. So this Ignite Spark toolbox has come up a couple times. This is a, a mock-up of the homepage that we're currently working on. Um, and so this isn't exactly, actually, if you have feedback on this, I just sent an email out to everyone at Ignite yesterday and said, please send us feedback. Um, but essentially our goal with this was to kind of rearrange the website in a way that you could get right to what you needed on the first page. So that if you wanted, for example, a provider survey, you could search directly on that right-hand side research tools box for provider surveys and it would take you right where you needed to go um, versus having to kind of click into there. So we were just looking at, at usability. Within this um, toolbox, there's clinicians and researchers area, and within this, we've tried to really think about what is it that we've needed to know and had to have when we're trying to implement or we're trying to conduct research in this area. So within, for example, the implementation space or the clinical space, that means we've broken it down by specific gene drug implementation. That may not be perfect for everybody if you look at preemptive testing, but it's a way to think about and organize this, uh, this concept intellectually and from your head. And so within that, for example, this shows the CYP2C19 and clopidogrel implementation. If you click on the resources for patients and providers, it takes you to a list of available patient education handouts, provider resources, slide templates for, uh, for presentations. And the goal of this is really to fill that implementation gap and to provide individuals with what they need to get from here to there um, in the easiest manner. So from A to B, kind of in the shortest and easiest manner possible without having to kind of reinvent that wheel. We have similar tools on the research side, including uh, data dictionaries. We're trying to really increase what's there. So if you have anything that you'd like to contribute, let us know, because we would love to um, also in include that here. And I think I'm done. I have my one minute warning from Teji. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge our, our, um, our very broad group, especially Julie and Laurie, who are here today. Um, Amanda Elsie, Mike Claire Salzer, and Dave Nelson are all in that PMP leadership group. And we've had a tremendous uh, support from uh, trainees and faculty who are helping us to do this every day. And also a number of, uh, of NIH grants, including the Ignite uh, Network Grant, and then of course support from UF and UF Health um, from an institutional perspective. Great, thanks, Kristen. Uh, if there's one quick question, we can take that. Yes. Just one, one compliment first. You didn't mention your, your newsletter, which I think oh. is really well done, and I hope it gets really wide dissemination. I think a lot of us get news feeds now as a way we get right. information, and I think yours does a great job of that. Um, the one question is, you've done a lot of different educational mm -hmm. interventions, and I imagine a lot of these are done in your provider network. Um, have you been able to measure, you know, which intervention has the greatest effect on adoption of ordering tests or following guidance? No, we haven't, and probably because it, you know we're still relatively early in the process. But I think that's something that we can begin to look at now. But I think that the educational intervention has. Um, I think there's a lot of different factors that would affect adoption, and so um, and, it, and so I'm not sure if you could kind of narrow it down to just what that intervention is from an educational standpoint. I'm trying to think of the kind of the different ways that we approach implementation. There's so many things that influence kind of the sustainability of that once that first is initially launched. I'm not sure if you could tease out that one piece, but it is definitely something it's something we're looking at now as far as our individual implementations is the sustainability and kind of what is influencing that. So. Great, and if there are additional comments or questions, we'll, we'll take them up during the discussion period. Our, our next speaker is Bob Wilden uh, and uh, from, from NHGRI, and he's going to talk to us about the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee and training pharmacogenomics practitioners.